All praise and thanks is due to Allah, Almighty God, alone. We praise Him and we thank Him on this blessed day of ours, our blessed Lord and Creator, of whom there is no other but He. He teaches us that He made us in this life with a purpose. That we have a reason for living and of that reason is to be thankful and grateful to Him. And because this life has a purpose, there is an end. Just like when you go to school, in the end you expect to receive a grade in your test. And this life is a test. As he says, It is he who has created death and then life again thereafter, that he may test you all to see which of you is the best indeed. This life is a test. The suffering, the hardship, the afflictions that we go through, it's a testing ground. We are in right now an examination. And we don't know when we will have to hand in that test. And just like in a real test and examination you go to at school, there are going to be some questions you find that are not hard, some that are more difficult, some that are very difficult. And even as we have to test who are the best, who get the A pluses, you have one or two questions that are designed that only they can pass. As we learn that the NBA were given the greatest of the tests. وَإِذِ بَتَلَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ That Allah Almighty God said, remember when we tested the Prophet Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, with many different tests and he passed every single one of them. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad also, <coughs> even on his deathbed, he was made to go through pain to test him. And as is narrated, as Sa'id al Khudri, he came to him. Or Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he came and he saw the Prophet and he put his hand on him. And between his head and the forehead of the Prophet, there was a cloth. And he could feel through that cloth the heat of his fever. He said, Ma ashadda hummaka ya Rasulullah, what a severe fever you have, O Messenger of God. And he said, at that moment, he says, Inna kathalika yashtaddu alayna al-bala wa yudha'afu lana al-ajr. Thus, God makes it that way for us, that He increases and intensifies the, the test, and He doubles or multiplies the reward. And in one narration he said, In ashadda al-nasi bala'an fi al-dunya al-anbiya, thumma al-amthal fa al-amthal wa fi riwayatan al-anbiya thumma salihun. That the most, the greatest in tests that God will give to human beings on this earth are number one, the prophets, and then the righteous that come after the prophets. And the Prophet ﷺ was told that he that death would of course touch him too. That every soul will taste death. And we will test each and every one of you, both with difficulty, pain, with good, and with evil. And all of this, you will in the end return, of course, to God. I will share one story with you. And it shows how a test can come. It's narrated by the Prophet ﷺ that the nation before us, the children of Israel, there were three men that Allah wanted to test them. And so He sent to them an angel. And that angel appeared to them and came to them and, and came to each one. And the first one, who was a leper, he had leprosy, Abras. He came to him and said, which thing would you love most out of this world? What one thing would you love? Yeah, basically you're giving your wish. He's giving him a wish. He says, I would love that this disease would be taken away from me and I would have beautiful skin and wouldn't be so repulsive in the eyes of the people. And so the angel touched him and his leprosy was removed from him. And then he asked them, which type of wealth would you love the most out of this world? 
or possession. He said, I would love to have, I love an ibn, I love camels. And so he gave him a, a sheep camel that was pregnant and ready to give birth. And he goes to the next person. And he, before he leaves, he says, Barakallaka, Barakallahu laka fiha. May Allah bless you in this camel. And then he goes to the, a bald man. And he asks him that question, what one thing would you love the most? He said, I would love that I would have beautiful hair like I used to when I was young. And so he touches him and then suddenly he has beautiful flowing locks of beautiful hair. And he said, what wealth would you like or what possession would you like the most? He says, I love babar. I love, I love camel. I love cows. I love... So he gives him one bakara. And then he asks him, he says, may Allah bless you in this cow of yours. And he moves on to another man, the third man to be tested. And he was a blind man. And he asked him, what one thing would you love the most out of this world? He says, I would love that I could see again. And so, he touches him, and suddenly he could see. That Allah healed him of his blindness. And he said, what one possession would you love the most? He says, I would love al-ghanam. I would love sheep. And so he gives him one sheep who's pregnant and, and ready to give birth. And he says, Barakallahu laka fiha. May Allah bless you in this. And then he leaves them. And to where, after some time, their livestock multiplied. And there was a valley filled with camels. And a valley filled with cows. And a valley filled with sheep. And he comes back to each of them. And he comes first to, this time appearing in a form that they did not recognize him. As a man, Rajul Miskeen, traveling upon the way. He says, I'm a poor man. And I've broken down on my travels. And I have no money and no means to get to where I'm going. Except for the help of Allah and you. So I ask you by the one. He goes first to the one who had leprosy. I ask you by the one who gave you such beautiful skin. And... I ask you to just give me one camel so that I can travel upon my way. The man replied, he said, al kathira." I have many obligations, many people who need many things. I'm sorry, I can't help you. The angel replied, who was disguised as the man, and said, Weren't you the man who had leprosy before? You look familiar. And then and you were poor, and then Allah made you rich. He said, No, that, 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 that was not me. It must be somebody else. Uh, because I have been given this wealth through my inheritance. I inherited it from my parents. So then he goes to the next man. He says, before he leaves, he says, He said, if you're lying, then may Allah change you back to the way you were before. And then he goes to the bald man. And the same thing. He asks him, he says, I'm a poor man who needs help to get upon my way. Can you just give me one cow? That man responds the same way. I'm sorry I have too many responsibilities. I can't. He refused to give him and to recognize Allah's favor upon him. And then he goes to the blind man and he tells him again the same thing. I'm a poor man. I'm homeless and I have no way. I've been traveling and I cannot get to where I'm going except for Allah's help and then yours. So I ask you by the one who gave you such beautiful eyesight to give me just one sheep that by it I can have some means, some wealth, to move along my way in life. He said, the, bald, the, the one who was blind, he responded, he said, take whatever you want and I will not refuse and not contest you in anything. Leave what you want, take what you want. I will not refuse you in anything you take for the sake of Allah this day by He who gave me my eyesight back. And at that moment, the angel re revealed to them, to him, who he really was. And he said that Allah has tested you, Emsik Malik, I have no need for your sheep. You all have only been tested by God and He is pleased with you and angry at your other two companions. As we can see from this story, that God will test us and He will test us and we may not even know we're being tested at times. And, he will, and as he did with these three men, to see if we are grateful for what we have been given. And he will also test us in other ways too, not mentioned in the story. In ways whereby hardships happen to us to see if we will be patient. And I want to address quickly a question that maybe some of us have heard before. <coughs> that's purported to us and said 
Why do such bad things happen? Why do calamities happen in the earth? And why are bad things happening to good people? How can this be? So as believers, we need to respond and understand how to, under to respond to this question by what is revealed to us in the Quran and the Sunnah. Number one, I want to remind us, of course, Allah says, Alif Lameen, did the people think they would be left till they can claim to believe? We are believers. They would say we're believers. And then they would not be put to a fitna and a test to see if, that, if they are truthful in that claim. Everything we're going to leave behind, brothers, and we know this life, life is a test. Number one, we should understand that. First of all, second of all, when we hear that question, why are the bad things happen? Why are there so much suffering in the earth? We should understand that when you say bad things happen to good people, number one, there's something wrong with this question. There's no one who's perfectly good. Only an angel is sinless and perfectly good. And is not going to be tested because an angel is not going to be rewarded or punished. And we know that at times we'll be given and then things will be taken away from us. Imagine you go home today and you not hear that you lost something important like you lost a thousand dollars in your business or you're fired from your job, but instead you come home and your house came down and you lost all of your family. You lost all of your wealth, your car, everything. You lost all that you can have. This happened to the Prophet Job Ayyub And when God was testing him, he was too shy out of all the goodness he had to ask for help for many years. But he was patient. And Allah says, We gave him back We gave him back his family because he tested him in this. Just like the bald man, he was not asked to give up any of his wealth. Because he was just being tested. Allah gave back to Ayyub, his family, and the like of, as a mercy from him, Inna wajadanahu sabira. Why? Because he said, I found him to be patient. When we hear that question, why is bad things happening in the world and suffering? Why does a bad thing happen to good people? We know this life is a test. How much intervention do we want to have when you have a righteous person? Like walking in the supermarket and suddenly uh, and when they slip on the floor instead of falling and breaking their back, a uh, tempurpedic mattress is put underneath them. Is that how much intervention that we expect God to have? Of course not. We know that life is a test. And sometimes we don't even understand the things that are happening. We don't see that there may be a greater good. That's how we function every day. Why do we get up early? Why do we study and work so hard in school? Why do we go? Why do we run five miles? Is that fun? It's painful for a lot of people to go out and exercise, but this is good for us. It's for the greater good. That's how we function every day. It may be the things we're seeing on earth, we consider them to be bad, but in the long run, Allah wants good for someone because of that. Other ways to understand the trials and tribulations we see on the earth is that these are means by which God will separate the pure from those who are not sincere. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذْرَ مُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْخَبِيطَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ In regards to the battles and the, the, the loss that the Muslims, the Sahaba, the early Muslims suffered, Allah says it was بلاء الحسن and this was a good test for them. And that He would separate between, we look at Syria, what's happening in Syria. This is to separate the Mahis to purify the believers and to separate between the good and the pure and those who are only claiming to be of the righteous. Also, it is not for us when we have something bad happen to us in our lives. It is not for us to attribute any suffering, pain, loss or calamity to Allah Azza wa Jalla. That is not proper edit with Allah. And that's what the ulama tell us and that's what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ That whatever inflicts you, whatever pain and difficulty you go through in this life, it is because of your own hands and what your own hands have put forward and your own actions. 
ظهر الفساد الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. When we look at these things on the earth, it's because of the actions of people, not because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Allah is not unjust. And thus we can understand, if I was to tell you why, why you see evil, let me ask you, can you bring me, for example, darkness? Can you go get me a bottle and fill it with darkness? Can any one of you do that? You can't do that because darkness doesn't exist as an entity with, it, with itself. In itself, it is in fact the absence of light, and thus the absence of following the guidance of God and being just, you have gold, you have oppression and injustice. And so what we are seeing is a natural reaction. Also, for us as believers, when bad things happen, when we're sick, when we have a fever, what, what, how are we taught to look at that? We look at that as we're supposed to be patient, that Allah will alleviate for us our sins. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَلِهِ لَا يُصِيبُ الْمُؤْمِنَ هَمٌ وَلَا غَمٌ وَلَا نَصَبٌ وَلَا وَصَبٌ وَلَا حَزَمٌ حَتَّى الشَّوْكَ يُشَاكُهَا إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ, عنه بِهَا خطأ مِنْ خَطَايَاهُ That the Prophet ﷺ tells us, I swear by the ones, the one, I swear by the one in whom his hands is my soul, that will not inflict any one of you any type of pain or hardship or suffering or calamity down to the prick of a thorn except that it will become a means of wiping out and covering over your sins. And that's why the, we are taught when anything bad, when some good happens, of course we say Alhamdulillah, but when something bad happens, what do we say? Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. That's the first lesson we learn when we say over 17 times a day. The first thing we say in our prayer is what? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. To remind us to be thankful for what we do have. We could always find someone less than us. And that's why the ulama say we are the Ummah of al -hammadin. Those who continually praise God despite whatever happens. So we look overseas and we see Great suffering, for example, what's happening in Syria. Thousands upon thousands of people that have died. Thousands of others, or millions, that are displaced from their homes and dying in the sea. And we have to put this into perspective, brothers and sisters. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us, this ummah, something special about the punishment for this ummah. He says, Ummati hadihi ummatun marhuma." That this nation of mine is a nation that is given the greatest of mercy. It is a nation shown mercy by Allah. لَيْسَ عَلَيْهَا عَذَابٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا عَذَابُهَا أو لَيْسَ عَلَيْهَا عَذَابٌ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابُهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا الْفِتَنُ الْفِتَنُ وَالْزَلَازِلْ وَالْقَتْلِ And this is an authentic hadith in Sahih Abi Dawood where the Prophet ﷺ says that this is an ummah given so much mercy that Allah did not, or the, its punishment, its adab will not be in this life, or it will not be in the, in the akhirah. It will be in this life in the forms. They will not have any punishment in the next life. Instead, the punishment will be in the forms of earthquakes, and, and earthquakes, and fit and trials and tribulations and killing. And so this is again, how are we supposed to react? I want to pose two questions. Number one, how are we as Muslims to react to these trials and tribulations that we see? And the second question is, how are we to react when we see these types of suffering happening to people who are not in fact Muslim? First of all, when we see this happening to ourselves as Muslims, we should remember the promise of Allah. That He promised for those who are patient, who are patient, salawatun. He said that He promised blessings upon that there will be ulaika alihim salawatun min rabbihim. That from Allah He will send blessings upon them. Not a person asking Allah to bless you. Allah personally will bless you, wa rahma, and He will write you down upon, upon as those who will be shown mercy. Wa ulaika humul muhtadun. This is what Allah subhanahu wa taala says in Surah Al-Baqarah. A promise of mercy and blessings 
and guidance from Him to be written down amongst those who are guided. So how are we to learn patience? The Prophet ﷺ says, As-sabru bit tasabur That patience is learned by practicing patience. Maybe we get angry, we get mad at things happening to us. One of the best du'a I was ever taught when I was uh, first, first a Muslim, and I was taught this actually at Hajj, which is a time where you have to show patience or you're going to lose the whole reward of why you're there. When you're sitting in the bus and walking and there's, there's people around you pushing and shoving. A brother there, uh, another uh, brother who embraced Islam, he told me this dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka a ridha ba'd al qada O Allah, I ask you to make me pleased with that which you have decreed. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are pleased with that which he is testing us with. And I will talk about the next, or address the next question in the second khutbah. I'll say this again, astaghfirullah al-azim, and I'll say this again. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Habibina, wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. To review some of what I was talking about before, how to respond to the difficulties, the trials and tribulations we face in this life. A Muslim is charged with ihtisab, seeking the reward from Allah and a sabr and being patient. In fact, we are even taught to run away from the fitan. In one narration, the dua that we learn is, Oh Allah, we ask you, for good, we ask you, Allahumma inna nas'aluka fi'al al-khayrat wa taqal munkarat wa ila aradta li ibadika fitnatan faqbidna ilayka ghayra maftuneen bi rahmatika ya arfa al-rahimeen Oh Allah, if you wish for your servants any fitna, then take us to our, take us to you in a way that we will not be tested and fail that test. Now, when we see the suffering of our, in our lives, maybe we ask the question, how do I know that this calamity or this thing that's going on in my life, how do I know that I'm being tested or this is punishment from Allah? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith, إِنَّ الْعَبْدِ إِذَا, إذا سَبَقَتْ لَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَنْزِلَةً أو مَنْزِلَةٌ لَمْ يَبْلُغْهَا بِعَمَلِهِ إِبْتَلَاهُ اللَّهُ فِي جَسَدِهِ أَوْ فِي مَالِهِ أَوْ فِي وَلَدِهِ That if someone has a station, that they have not yet reached in Jannah, that is, that is written for them, that they will have that level of paradise, then God will test them in, in their wealth and in their children. It, so, because the, they will be patient in that test, and then thereafter, they will, because of their patience, reach that high status and that high level. Also, when we, when we see all of the tragedy happening to our brothers and sisters overseas, maybe we think, oh, Maybe God doesn't like these people, that's why they're forced to go through so much suffering and we have things so much nice and easy here. Well, in another hadith, the Prophet wasallam, he clarifies this, this issue and he says that in عظم الجزاء مع عظم البلاء that the greater the reward Come, the greater reward comes with the greater test. And in for in Allah, إِذَا أَحَبَّ قَوْمًا إِبْتَلَاهُ فَمَنْ رَضِيَ لَهُ الرِّضَى فَمَنْ رَضِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى وَمَنْ سَخِطَ فَلَهُ السَّخَطَ And then those amongst them that are patient and are pleased and are okay and say, I accept this. I know this is from Allah. Then Allah will be pleased with them. And those who are angry and not patient over that test. <laughs> then Allah's anger would be upon them. And so we ask Allah to protect us from that. <laughs> and the ulama say basically, in conclusion of that, that if somebody is patient and they seek the ihtisab, they seek the hisab from Allah, then it is a bala. If they are not patient, it would be a uquba or punishment from Allah. Now what happens when we see these tragedies, like what we saw in Paris? A lot of innocent people, were killed, and they were not Muslims. Should we, how we as Muslims should feel about that? And of course, this, the, the, the terrible thing 
is that there are people doing this that are claiming to be Muslim. So how are we supposed to react? And sadly, you'll find many Muslims, if they react, when they see a tragedy, it happens to somebody who's not a Muslim, they say, look, if it happens to a Muslim, that's a big deal. But when it happens to someone who's not a Muslim, that's not a big deal. You know, they're not Muslim, they're not one of us. Now I want to tell you, there's something extremely wrong with this attitude. The NBA, when they were sent to their people, they came as a mercy to, to those people, and they, whether they were Muslim, whether they were someone of another faith. Look at, for example, Shu'aib When he came to the people, he had deep care about those people, whether they were Muslim or not. He says, <laughs> well, he said, Don't cheat the people. Doesn't matter, Muslim or non-Muslim, don't cheat the people. The buyer, the seller, we have to deal justly with people, even if it's against ourselves. Kunu qawwamina bil qist shuhada wa law ala anfusihim. Even if it's against yourself, stand up as a witness for the truth. If this is wrong, stand up and say it is wrong. And we denounce this, and this is not what Islam teaches. In fact, the opposite. The NBA, when they came, the Prophet ﷺ, look at the first few surah revealed. These are verses talking about being dishonest with people, not with Muslims, with anyone. Other verses, for example, One of the first verses revealed in Mecca, talking about the yateen. Did, did Allah SWT say, oh, it's only the Muslim orphan that we care about? No. And Allah SWT also says in the Qur'an, وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ An innocent life of a child that was killed as an orphan, as I mean, killed as a baby girl, she will be asked, for what crime were you killed? Innocent people who did nothing to you. We should care about them. The Prophet ﷺ described himself, he says, in the مَثَلِ وَمَثَلُ النَّاسِ كَمَثَلِ رَجُلٍ إِسْتَوْقَدَ نَارًا that the example of me and the people is like the example of a man who lit a fire in the desert. And that fire started to bring light. And so the insects, they come and they jump in the fire. And you are like, the people are like the insects that I'm pulling you back. Who is he talking about? He's talking about all mankind. Trying to keep them from falling into the fire. He had so much compassion. We as Muslims undoubtedly believe that the Prophet ﷺ was the most concerned for the plight of all humanity and their case and their condition and how they are, how they are, whether they were Muslim or not. And even Allah described him. He says, would you kill yourself out of grief? You're almost about to die out of grief because you're sad that they would not believe. It, it affected the heart of the Prophet ﷺ so much. We as Muslims should care about any innocent life that is taken. Then it's done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّذِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Do not kill the life of anyone except a that which is injustice or by due process, the kill the killer. And when Umar al-Khattab, it was brought to him a case of a man who was not a Muslim, who killed a Muslim. And they said, what should we do? And he was so shocked that he, why could you come to me with this question? al qisas it's in the Quran. A life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is justice. How can you come to me and tell me something that Allah has made general and say that we must make it specific and this is only in the case of when a Muslim is killed. That we are only in the case when a Muslim is killed that we would have the retribution. And so if we want justice, we have to stand up for justice, all of us. And we have to have compassion for everybody no matter what their faith is. It is that rahmat al-alameen Allah made the Prophet ﷺ, who is not here, that we are here as his ambassadors and examples. How is that rahmat supposed to reach them except through us? So we have to have love and compassion. You cannot guide someone that you hate to be du'at, 
to the oneness of God and the religion of Almighty God or the religion of the prophets, it necessitates that you have mercy and compassion for others. O oh Allah, make us of those who listen to the speech and follow the best of it. O oh Allah, we ask you to make us of those who have patience during your tests and your trials in this life. O oh Allah, we ask you if you wish for your servants any type of trials or tribulations or fit them more than we can bear to take us to you in a way that we have passed the test. O oh Allah, we ask you to make us of the patient. Allahumma ja'adna min as Allahumma aiz al Islam, Allahumma nasr al Islam wa aiz al Muslimin, wa jalla min al Ladin ya istahkoon al Nasr ka ya Rabb al Alamin. Allahumma la tadagna dhamba illa ghafarta, wa la hamma illa farrajta, wa la dina illa qabaita, wa la maridan illa shafaita, wa la haja min hawaj al Dunya wa al Akhirah illa qabaita ya Rabb al Rahimin. Allahumma fil al Muslimin wa al Muslimat, al Ahiya minhum warham al Amwat. Inna ka qarib mujib al Dawat. Inna Allah yamur bil Adil wa al Ihsan wa Ita al Qurba wa ya ها عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكر الله يذكركم اشكر الله يزركم ولا ذكر الله أكبر وأقيم الصلاة